If Jeremiah is not Olamfola, who is he? I am picking up at a place where we, specifically this church, and anyone that's been around for 20, 30, 40, even 50 years, <laughs> I keep going, there might be someone here for that longer period of time, but you're still useful, so we won't say. <laughs> but um, we've believed, been told, that basically Jeremiah went to Ireland took the daughters of King Zedekiah as King Zedekiah's sons were killed in front of him, his eyes basically taken out of his head, led away in chains, and as the story goes, and it's quite legendary, that Jeremiah took the daughters of Zedekiah, first fled to Egypt, and then afterwards, Jeremiah, the scribe Baruch, the daughters of King Zedekiah, along with something called Jacob's stone or Jacob's pillar and the Ark of the Covenant all went with them as they made their way eventually to the Emerald Isle, Ireland. That's all a wonderful story and if you go online, I said this to you, if you go online you will find website after website regurgitating this marvelous legend which I actually believed is true for decades. Unfortunately it's not. And Part of what I'm going to do today is give you enough proof because the other legendary part of this is you're going to read materials. Say a book like this. This book begins to parrot that Jeremiah is none other than the person we've come to know as Olam Fola, or Fodla as the name is written. And there are many books that just keep propagating that. So here's where we begin. We're going to begin with what I would call some of the most hardcore information. First of all, what we, what we do know is we have a timeline. So I'll first show you, thank God my staff is kind because I first did this in my own handwriting to show you and then I said, no, nah, I'll spare you, but just to show you that I did write it out for you at first and I thought, no, nah, I better have somebody type it so you can read what I've done here. But what you have here is, you've heard me mention these people before, the Firbolgs that basically fit into this timeline, and there's two timelines, and I'll explain in a minute, the Tuatha Dé Danann, likewise, the Malaysian High Kings start here from 1700 BC approximately to 76 AD. Now, the FM is from, this is the most modern copy I could find, the Annals of the Four Masters, which basically is the oldest uh, in terms of what people have used to go back to look at Irish history. And this Forus slash AM will actually be Forus Fisa R Aran, which is actually, for English-speaking people here, would be more along the lines of Keating's history of Ireland. But these are very old materials. So when, now let me give you the, um, the typed version here. All right, so I want you to take a look at something. I've lined up, basically, we have the first Milesian king starting with Eber and Eremon, and there may be some overlapping. You're gonna see two timelines here, and the reason for that is that in the Chronicles of the Four Masters, this is the timeline given, and in the Forest Fisa, this is the timeline given. But you might say, well, that's a big scope and discrepancy, but it's irrelevant for the point I'm about to make. Most records, say, excuse me, most records, and let me find the book here, The Story of the Irish Race. Wherever I can give you a book that you can reference, although this book has plenty of errors. In fact, I found errors in almost every book. I'm sorry to say that. The Story of the Irish Race by Seamus McManus, and this is a uh, 1979 uh, Devin Adair Company book. This book basically makes a reference and says Olam Fadla, or Olam Fala, was the 21st Milesian king. I found other references that say he was the 20th, but let's just say between 20 and 21. I'm sorry to be ambiguous for the moment. 
And I want you to take a look at where the 21st, 21st Milesian king, Olem Fola, I don't care which list you use, but if we were trying to make him Jeremiah, Jeremiah lived in the 580s BC. The timeline is not right. And I don't, I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to keep repeating this, go check me out. This is from the most reasonable uh, articles and source material. In fact, it goes on to list six of the sons of Olemfala, who basically will reign after him successively, how they reigned, how they died, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you first encounter this big impasse that if you're going to try and make Olemfola, Jeremiah, the timeline is completely wrong. And that's why I started here to show you we've been kind of just, you might say, well, how did this happen then? And I'm going to show you. Very easy. I can see how certain things occurred. So we know, for example, that uh, Olam Fola's father's name is Fiaka Finskothach, who reigned 1353 to 1333. That's the period he ruled. And why I'm including that fact is because if we were still trying to make the bridge to Jeremiah, we have the record of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, who is not the son of this person. All right, so that's that. Equally, uh, as I just stated from this book uh, that I just quoted, uh, Seamus McManus, uh, the quote is, Olam Fala blessed Ireland with the reign of 40 years, also referring to Olam as the 21st Milesian king from this book. And as I said, if you're looking in any other sources, he's either listed as the 21st or the 20th. And any book that lists him other than in that time frame has regurgitated material basically that was propagated in the 1800s, which I will give you the people, personages. You can go check this out for yourself, who started a lot of these wonderful, intricate legends, which we have basically accepted as time has gone on, unfortunately for us. Um, so what we have is from these records, um, it's pretty clear. I think the first point to just say is abundantly clear. The Bible makes clear at what time Jeremiah lived. How do we know that? Because King Zedekiah is the last ruling king before the fall of Jerusalem in 586. That puts Jeremiah at 586 BC. It is not even close. But hold that thought for a, for a second here. So what we do know about Olamfala becomes more evidence that this is not Jeremiah. We have certainty that Olamfala was born and raised and died in that land called Ireland, native to it. Historical records say he died of natural causes uh, at his home in Tara. As for his sons, it gives even the depth and scope of, as I said, how they died. One dies of the plague, one died at the banquet hall, one was killed by another leader's son. It's all out there. You can say, well, are these legend kind of people? Or are they real people? Well, as far as the record is, here's what I'm going to tell you about knock yourself out. Ireland and Irish history is very much like trying to trace the history of the Greeks. There's a lot of mythological stuff. And in the mythology, you'll find the kernels of truth that you've got to dig out to make sense of things. So in what is called the Annals of Clone Mac Macnoise, uh, dating from 1891, Sage Publishing, Cornell University Library, on page 34 of this book, uh, Olam Fala of the House of Ulster was king of Ireland and of him Ulster to the name. Why was that comment important to me? Because as I began to dig, I found out that there wasn't one singular king. You'll probably hear me say this because it's later in my notes. But Ireland was broken up into five parts. And in those five parts, each part had a king that ruled. So even to make Olam Fala the ruler of all Ireland is nonsensical, even according to their records. Okay. Um, we do know that it's been attributed. If you're going by the legend of Jeremiah and Olam Fala, it was, it was propagated somewhere that Olam Fala instituted the feast 
what's called the feast, but it's actually the feast at Tara, which is the hill Tara, celebrated once a year. But that is not true either, okay? We can look in the records and see that the tribe of the Tuatha de Danan that was there before the Malaysians came were celebrating at the hill called Tara. Now, for the folks who don't know what the heck I'm talking about, could the director put up image number three for me? There's the hill called Terra. I got that so that people would have something to, that's a modern day image of what that looks like. And if you would also pull up for me image number nine, which is the mound of the hostages at the hill of Terra. And that kind of gives you a side view of the mound as well. So they came there once a year. Um, basically, if you were a dutiful subject, you would show up because if you didn't, you were considered the king's enemy and probably faced certain death. Uh, with kings like that, who needs enemies, right? Um, but basically, we have some important things that we can know as I'm going to go do this side-by-side -side juxtaposition of Olam Fola and Jeremiah. So biblical Jeremiah. What do we know about biblical Jeremiah? In Jeremiah 16, if you want to turn there, I'll just read something briefly to you, though. It says, The word of the Lord came also unto me, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife, neither shalt thou have sons or daughters in this place. And goes on to spell out why. But one has to remember something. Whether God was simply giving the instructions to Jeremiah in this place, speaking of the place that he was prophesying at, or whether that was meant as a edict for all time, I can't say. I can only say that it says, Thou shalt not take a wife, neither have sons or daughters in this place. And we know that by the time Jeremiah leaves Jerusalem, he's got to be somewhere between 70 or 80 years old. Uh, as I said, he's the son of Hilkiah, a priest that have, were in Anathoth, uh, in the land of, actually, Benjamin. So we have enough information on these two individuals and the timelines that they lived and the information that we have to say unequivocally somebody conflated and took pleasure, by the way. I'm, it actually pisses me off. I'm just going to say it like that, that somebody would have done that so dishonest to try and force a point, to try and drive something and to make something fit in a box when, unfortunately, they would have done much better to stick to the truth, which is far more interesting. And we'll get to that truth shortly. Now, we know, as I said, that the Tuatha de Danan had their epicenter, their worship center at Tara. In fact, as far as you can go back, you can trace that they were worshiping at that hill, which is long before the Milesians came and invaded the land, part of that group being the descendants that lead you to Olam Fola. He was not the institutor, if you will, of these celebrations. Now, let me find another book here, I'm trying to give you all the tools for you people who would be like, oh, you're shaking your fist at me, right? Um, so, according to Charles Squire, Celtic Myth and Legend, 1975, Newcastle Publishing, page 125, the Milesians began their march on Terra, which was the capital of the Tuatha de Danan. So again, let's just dispel that we're, we've got a lot of things that have been mixed up. If you are interested in doing more research and you cannot find a copy of this, you can go to the University College Cork, National University of Ireland, because they've published the electronic version of this. So you can peruse it for yourself, the four masters, if you're interested in looking up any information. And I'm going to keep repeating this through my message. For the love of God, please check out what I'm saying, all right? Don't rely on Wikipedia. Uh, that's one of the most reliable sources you can go to. You know that, right? Good God. Okay. In Keating's History of Ireland, Book 2, Section 8, tells us that the chroniclers or historians were bound to be with the nobles wherever they went because they would write down 
basically their great, their great conquests, their great feats, and also their very dismal losses. They would chronicle everything. It was, the idea was to have an eyewitness that would basically be there like an embedded reporter. So you might say, how do we have all these records? And are these records trustworthy? Well, these records are more trustworthy than much of the information that I found on the, on the internet. I'm going to tell you what's really frustrating. So most of you may have this book, Jacob's Pillar. It's by one of the beloved uh, Capt, Raymond Capt. Uh, unfortunately, I find regurgitated material in here too with very care. You've got to read carefully. Conjecture, hypothesis, not concrete. Here we have evidence. Here is the the place where you're going to find this. this is why I'm giving you all this information. It's important for me to put this down crystal clear for anybody who wants to look at the reference material because a lot of these people, I'll tell you what I found. A lot of these people are quoting ancient writers and because I, thank God, have the luxury of having a lot of these ancient sources, I'm going to look in these sources and I am not finding. Not finding because they not only didn't quote a section, a page, a chapter, but I comb through the bulk of the writings where people have said, oh, in the Chronicles of Thus, in the Chronicles of Eri, or in the Chronicles of This, it's not there. So when you, when, as a person who does research, if you're not willing to put out your sources, that is including, that's why I'm giving you the books, I'm giving you the publisher, I'm giving you the page number, I want people to know where you can find this information. Why? Because the bulk of the information out there is so skewed and so wrong. Now, is this going to make or break anybody's faith? No, it's not. But I'm trying to set the record straight and actually put this down as solid information for anybody out there who's actually looking for the truth. All right, as I mentioned earlier, the one more piece of conflation is that um, with the five major kingdoms, you would always have usually five representatives of each territory. So Meath, Connacht, Leicester, Munster, and Ulster, sometimes called the five-fifths of Ireland. So anybody that thinks there was one independent king, that happens much later. But in the period of history we're looking at, they are individual, individually ruled by a sovereign in each area. Within Meath, Meath, Terra, Briga, and um, I guess they had a close association in that area with the Picts, the first king of Meath who gave his name to Terra. His name was Tarvo. So we have also these ideas that the hill of Tara is named after somebody. I'll tell you who it's named after. I just gave you this as a quote that this gentleman leaves his name to this hill, but you'll see that it also belongs to somebody else. So. It's kind of, there's all these t intricate ties in this story. Uh, Tarvos was the name basically lent to Tara. Meath would later be conquered, of course, by the Milesians. Uh, of Connaught, it, its first king was Sreng, uh, a Firbolg prince who established the kingdom's first capital city, Sligo. Each one of these has their own history. So if you were interested, if you were a fanatic, you could knock yourself out with each of these respective histories. With the area that we're looking at, um, as I said, it, it has a strong connection from the 1700s on to the Malaysian kings. Um, there is a book which is often quoted called the Libor Gabala, which is the book of invasions, um, that basically says that Ireland was being ruled by three Danite kings when at the time of the Malaysian invasion, making basically a full circle, bringing that back to Tara. And what basically you see at that time is you have five different kings. At the time they invaded three ruling of the Tuatha de Danann, later five different kings will rule. We know that they are a very diverse people. And what's interesting is what was pointed out by a man named and I hope I see this right, because some of these names are just hard to pronounce, Donahade O'Garian pointed out in 1922 in his lecture at University College Cork that there is a correlation of the way 
these kept their genealogical records to the Old Testament. So whether or not these people knew who they were, it's very clear that there were certain things embedded in the style of the way they kept records, son of so on, son of so on, son of so on, which in turn becomes Mac. That's the version of son of so on, Mac. We have all these names, including this guy here, Mac Manus. I don't know, is he the son of a hand? I don't know. Anyway, never mind. All right, so um, here is where I start gleaning a lot of information on what we have believed. The bulk of the information that has circulated in our time, let's say for over the last, um, call it 40 to 50 years, basically came out of the Worldwide Church of God under Herbert Armstrong, um, the evangelist Herman Ho, who basically uh, was the pioneer at Ambassador College, seems to have propagated many of these conflated and even fabricated ideas. Uh, when I went to read his own work, he places, you gotta love this, it's just clever that everybody can just say what they want and they don't back it up. He places Olamfala's reign at 714 to 714 to 674 BC and tries to make this Jeremiah and obviously doesn't know that, the, again, the timeline is still incorrect. So it, it's boggling, mind-boggling to me that anyone would put down information like this and not go to the secular records and say, wait a minute, let's check this out. Now there was another person who, who then started to propagate the idea that there were two Olamfolas, not one, but two. That, my friends, I've combed the records, is not true at all. So you're going to find, maybe after this message, you might go online, and you, or maybe you've already been online, and you've seen a lot of what I'm saying. This is why it's important to do this type of research for people who are interested. And I realize, by the way, this subject today is not for everyone, but for, especially, I feel, the people who have been in this ministry for any amount of time, it's good to put things in proper order and have it delivered to where, as I said, you can go look for yourselves. I have nothing to hide here. Um, so then we have another problem, the stone of destiny. Oh, I just love this one. So I want you to take a look. The director will put up for me image number two, please. This image, the top part of it, as you can see with the metal links in the top part of it, which is sitting on top of another pillar, but it just the, the top portion would have been essentially what we're referencing as Jacob's pillar. Now, that is called the Stone of Destiny, the Stone of Scone, sometimes called Leofelt. I want you to take a look at another image, though. This one is image number one. It's a stone at Tara Hill. It's also called Leofelt. You like that? By the way, that's a phallic symbol, just <laughs> FYI. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. All right, so uh, who knew that that would pop up in this message? OK, let's keep our mind on the Lord or somewhere in between. So here's my big conundrum with this. Um, we, we do know that the flat stone, the first image I showed you, that stone, the purported history. So if you go to a book like this, which is a good old book called Westminster Abbey by A.P. Stanley, and within here he does a lot of referencing about the stone and how the stone got to, I'll read this in a minute, how the stone got to where it got from where it was, but here's what I'd like to point out there. Um, so our, let's call it apocryphal or legendary story, says that Jeremiah brought the Leofel, that, that stone block, which was Jacob's pillar, brought it to Ireland. I have a couple of problems with this, and I'm going to tell you what they are. The first one is that that stone weighs approximately 335 pounds. Now, if that's not good enough for you, because the legend also says that he brought the Ark of the Covenant. And I had to do a little bit of rough calculations. If you take the weight of the wood that was used for the Ark of the Covenant, the hammered gold, which would have been very thin, the, the full thick gold on the lid, 
the covered over, overlaid cherubim and whatnot, cherubim that are on the lid, everything there, you're going to probably get to, and again, this is an approximate, do not quote me on this, but I'm going to say that that Ark of the Covenant minimally on the low side would weigh 350 pounds and probably on the high side uh, over 600 pounds, which is why it would take at least four men with staves to carry the darn thing around. So if we were going to adhere by the laws of how God said this thing must be transported, then it goes without saying that if the legend is true that Jeremiah brought the Stone of Destiny and the Ark of the Covenant, I'd like to ask you two things. Why in the book of Jeremiah, we don't read that he was lugging this stone around when he was thrown in prison or when he went to Egypt. There's no mention of it. Okay, that could be. Sometimes things are omitted. But let's go to the other side and let's take the story and say at face value, Jeremiah traveled with Baruch the scribe and the daughters of Zedekiah and they stop first in Spain and then they pull up onto the land called Ireland. You don't think that about that time, somebody would have seen a gold ark and been more enamored with a gold ark than a rock? <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, like, that's logic right there. These people probably had not seen something that ornate, let alone that metal that had not really made its way, although there was gold in circulation, but not like that. You don't think that anywhere in all of the records of all of the Irish writing down, you don't think that they would say this mysterious golden box, not knowing what it was, and probably would have, knowing the culture, would have looked at it as a magic box, not as, well, who is God? Whatever the gods were for them in that day, it would have been a magic box, something that could have had fantastic spells or whatever let alone, by the way, what was supposedly put in the ark. If you know what that is, the three items that were supposedly put in there, this is highly unlikely. Furthermore, when you're reading in the book of Jeremiah, it clearly says that the Babylonians basically went into the house of the Lord. They stole what they could. They took off with what they did, and they burnt the rest. Now, there is great legend, again, within Jewish tradition that says, oh, but wait, they knew that this was going to happen, so they buried the ark and other items underneath in some not yet discovered hallway underneath the temple walls somewhere. Okay, you know what? If that's so, then we have another problem because the Mishnah says that there was no ark of the covenant in the second temple. Okay, we'll come back to that one maybe. That was too much, so let's, let's move on from there. So, you might ask, where did the legend come from? And I'm, I'm going to read it to you. You tell me if there's not a high amount of just making stuff up here to make something fit. If we turn to the Chronicles of Erie, being the history of Gael Siot Eber, or the Irish people, by Roger O'Connor, volume 2, page 89. So you can go check it out for yourself. Quote, For being few to journey in the land, they would move on the face of the waters in search of their brethren, led by two of the race to the extremity of the world of land to the sun's going down. As they had heard when they were driven from their course, the vessel was born to this land, and here was broken. Basically, they crashed, they made a crash landing, whoever these two of the race were. But all of the men came safe with Leofel, chiefs of Eber, Gael of Siot. Look on this stone, be thus guard well, this blessed gift, and in what land his messenger shall stay, a chief of Eber shall bear sway. Now, Two of the race, that's really a big stretch to say, oh, that, that's definitively Jeremiah and Baruch. That's a big stretch, a big one. But let's put that aside. My other problem with this is that if we trace this back far enough, whichever Leofel we're referring to, whether it's the phallic one or the one that goes under the coronation chair, both of these do not align in a proper timeline. So everything will go back to a timeline 
of Jeremiah. We know that at least the phallic symbol was there and has been there for a long time. And the stone of scone or the stone of destiny or the coronation stone, we can trace it back pretty far. So the question is, how could somebody just kind of extrapolate from this and just neatly tack it together? And if this is not the answer, what is the answer? So the next one is this, and I'm just going to point a few of these out. If the legend was true and Jeremiah landed on the land with Baruch, the rock, and the Ark of the Covenant, and other people, plus the daughters of Zedekiah, I think, again, we would either have mention of something coming off there, a little bit more than a rock, which was commonplace, by the way. If you know anything about the mega and monoliths that scatter the land that go back three, four, and 5,000 centuries BC, or 5,000 BC, these people were accustomed to seeing rocks everywhere. So what would be special about this rock versus a gold box or versus fair maidens, if they were that? I'm just making this up right now. They could have been as ugly as you know what. But fair maidens arriving from a far land, far away, right? Sounds very uh, Irish, doesn't it? But if we begin tracing the stone, we find out that the stone has been there long before, if indeed to Jeremiah's timeline, it was there before his time. So the question is going to be, where did the stone come from? How did it get there? And by the way, just as an FYI, the stone, the flat stone, that, will, that has basically been under the coronation chair. We have an image of that somewhere. Yes, we do. Image number six. I don't know that they'll be using this particular chair, but when Charles is actually, um, when he has his coronation, the stone will actually come from Scotland to be placed under the chair for his coronation. So, you know, you can say we're all wrapped up in this, but there's got to be a kernel of truth that we have to be able to trace. So that's what we're doing. Um, okay, according to, got to find the right book. According to the elders, Faith of Ireland, Pre-Christian Traditions, Wood, Martin, Volume 2, 1902, Longman's Green and Company, page 257, the Leofel, which it is recounted that the Danans brought it with them to Ireland. Now, I'm not, listen, I'm not saying that any one of these particular materials, that's the truth right there. But there's enough information that leads us away from the nicely crafted legend we have all wholeheartedly accepted. According to the Book of Terra, Michael Slavin, Wolfhound Press, 1996. Being a godly race, the Danan had brought with them four divine gifts with them to Terra. That includes the Leofel, the Stone of Destiny. From Phalius was brought the Leofel, which was in Terra, and it would not utter a cry, but under every king that should take Ireland. And this information I just read also comes to us confirmed in the Leob Leobar Gabala as well, Book of Invasions. So. I don't know what timeline, but there are at least, I've counted, eight sources that attribute the stone arriving in the time of the Tuatha de Danan, not in the time of the Milesians, not even in the time of Jeremiah. And by the way, sorry to do this to you, but for those people who would still be saying, ah, there's got to be something there, I'm sorry, I didn't do the thing that I should have showed you, which is take the list of kings we started looking at, where I showed you where Olamfala is, go to the end. So I, I did this all the way down to the period of time that would have been Jeremiah's timeline from this Forest Fisa to look at the names here to see if any of them fit our person, Jeremiah. They don't. Furthermore, Simon Brock, I want you to take a look at him. He's the king, 910 to 904 BC, or depending on the records here, he is a king. Now, there could be more than one Simon Barak, yes, but I'm just showing you what we see here. And if you take this to the last page, because this second column gives you to Jeremiah's time in this line, this column gives you 
the time of Jeremiah in this line, you can see there is no one who resembles in any way, shape, or form Jeremiah or even an Olam Fola, just in case there might have been a second one as somebody is put out there and promulgated. All right? So I'm hoping thus far, even for the hardheads, you can say, yeah, I can be honest enough to see that what she's saying is true. Um, if we know what was celebrated, again, from this book of Tara, principal beliefs of pre-Christian religion at Tara centered on Mother Earth Goddess, her relationship to the sovereignty of the king. And these beliefs were celebrated at an annual feast which divided the year, which were fixed by full moons. Got a lot of superstition, but a lot of feasts fixed with the moons. Um, so, for example, the full moon of February called Imbolg, May called Beal time, August called Lugnaza, and November called Samhain, from which we get All Hallows Day or Hall the day or two before Halloween, which was celebrated at Terra, which is to tell you that they had pagan festivities going there, not anything that resembled Hebraic or Israelitish in tradition whatsoever. The mound, we know, at least goes back to at least two, but definitely beyond 2000 BC. So it was already built. I'm just trying to now be ridiculous in killing this thing, which has unfortunately been what I'd call a big plague to me in my understanding of things, but a blessing at the same time. Uh, astronomer Martin Brennan in The Stars and the Stones conducted an observation of these sites and more than proved the alignment of the full moon and sunrises and whatnot published in this book where he concluded that a place called Newgrange, which is not too far away, is aligned with the winter solstice. The chamber under the mound of hostages, which I showed you at Terra, was for the full moon uh, in August, the date and the ancient celebration of the rising of the sun and festival periods in November, Samhain. So we see more pagan worship, more Mother Earth worship. We're not reading about any Torah, any, you know, people like to say, okay, Tara, Torah. A lot of things have been read in here. And I'm not going to say there's not a possibility, but if you consider that all these things were established infinitely in antiquity, and we're trying to put a more modern spin, modern by like the 500s BC, <laughs> then we have a problem. And it's abundantly clear. Um, okay, so we know that the gathering of Terra served multiple things. R disputes were resolved. Kings were once in a lifetime, basically once in their lifetime, no matter where you were reigning, came to, to Terra to be basically crowned. Um, and of course, there was the making of the laws. Now, Olam Fola is attributed with opening up a school, and it's always said the school of learning, the school of wisdom, and that may or may not be true. But what we do know is that there were many people instituting or trying to institute places of learning at that time. So I find it ironic that just one person is highlighted because it fits the agenda, all right? Um, lots of reference material. I'm going to rattle a few things off that I didn't bring with me. The Serpent and the Goddess, Harper Row. Mary Condren, 1989, Celtic Shaman, John Matthews, Dorset, 1991, Pagan Past, Christian Present, Kim McCone, 1990, Historical Memorials, which I already showed you, of Westminster Abbey, Arthur Stanley, London, 1876. So, you might ask, if Jeremiah didn't bring the stone, who in the heck did? Are you interested? Yes. <laughs> I thought you weren't, so I was just going <laughs> to move on. Okay, well, let's, let's do a little, go back in history for a second. So we know that the stone is special for this reason. Jacob, while he's out there, he uses that stone to lay down his head at night, and from that moment, he, in a dream, sees the angels going up and down. He, the Lord was in this place, surely I knew it not. It's, it's like the first time his eyes are open to the fact that God is present and with him. Now, we kind of neatly read that passage, and we don't think anything much beyond that. But the fact of the matter is, we know that there was a famine, and 
Jacob, who is Israel, would have made his way along with his children to Egypt to get food. We know that from the Bible. So the question is, when Jacob, Israel, went to Egypt, did he bring the stone with him? Or is it at all possible that when Jacob, Israel, dies, and before he dies, he tells Joseph, take me back to the land where I live to bury me there in the sepulcher there that he's chosen, is it at all possible that that stone was either brought to Egypt when they came for the famine, or it was retrieved in the land, basically, that they buried him in and was taken back to Egypt. But one thing that does not make sense whatsoever, and I just want you to hear me out on this, because, again, anybody looking to piece things together, you got to think about this. So we know that it says, eventually, after Joseph dies, there rose up a pharaoh who didn't know who Joseph was, and then we read about the children of Israel going into Egypt's bondage. They were not in bondage for 430 years, but they were in Egypt for 430 years, which means if you're going to say that the stone was brought, left there, and when they went into Egypt's bondage, they brought the stone with them, you're a lunatic. That's highly unlikely. A big amount of conjecturing would go into that. However, if you want to make sense of the story, you begin to find, and it's repeated multiple times, so I'll read it from this, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what this is. So from Westminster Abbey, A.P. Stanley, uh, this one is an 1896 edition, not too bad. All right, um, so in the capital of the Scottish kingdom was a venerable fragment of rock to which at least as early as the 14th century the following legend was attached. The stony pillar on which Jacob slept at Bethel was by his countrymen transported to Egypt. Thither came Gethelus, son of Cecrops, king of Athens, married Skoda, the daughter of Pharaoh. He and his Egyptian wife, alarmed at the fame of Moses, fled with the stone to Sicily or Spain. From Brigantia in Spain it was carried off by Simon Breck, the favorite son of Milo the Scot, to Ireland. Okay. If you are like me, you're going to encounter this story over and over again. And watch, I'm going to show you how people just manage to conflate once more. Very carefully, even if this is legend, it says Skoda was a daughter of Pharaoh, not a daughter of Zedekiah. I think there's a big difference there, just saying. So that kind of baffled me because I'm now thinking, is there any validity? Who is this Skoda? So I start down the path. I'm just telling you, you want to know how I get to places where it's like nonstop traveling through a black hole? Join me, all right? So I start down the process of looking for a daughter of a pharaoh named Skoda. And I don't find it until I find a pharaoh I've never heard of, Pharaoh Singris. He was known as Pharaoh Singris in the Isle of Crete by the descendants of Cecrop, the descendants of Chalcol. You remember that teaching. If you don't, please go back and listen to that. Singris turns out to be none other than Akhenaten. Okay, this gets in interesting. So you know, you're saying, what the heck does this mean? Okay, try this on for size. So. Before the children of Israel go into Egypt's bondage, the stone is taken away by Chalcol's son, Gethelis, all right? And basically, Eremon would be the first Milesian king crowned upon it. But here's the beautiful thing. When you start going into the history, you find the name of Pharaoh's daughter, not Skoda, and I hope I say this right too. Her name is Ake Hasamun. And you start to follow her history. She's the third daughter of Akhenaten. And when Akhenaten basically is out of the picture, she is forced. She's still a young child. She's forced to marry the successor pharaoh. He dies. Then she is forced. She is now 13 years old. And she's forced to marry the young boy king, eight years old, King Tut. Something happens to him. And a little bit after the time of his death, 
she is now classified as Egypt's lost princess. She completely disappears from their history, and they'd like to tell you conveniently that that means she died. Unfortunately, that's not a good enough answer, and the reason is if she was the wife of not just one pharaoh, but the wife of two pharaohs and the daughter of a pharaoh, she would have had a prominent burial place, not necessarily within King Tut's burial place. We know that he was buried with the two stillborn, or um, they were stillborn children. But she would have had a place maybe where they buried the queens. She is, her body is nowhere to be found. And interestingly enough, whether you want to say this is legend or not, there are enough sources that would basically make this very plausible, including the following that I'm about to share with you. In 1955, Dr. Sean O'Reardon was digging at the picture I showed you, the mound of the hostages. What he uncovered was the remains of a young boy. The remains date back to the 1300s BC, which fits the timeline of one possibly named Skoda eventually. It also fits the timeline of the Malaysian kings. The remains date back to 1300 BC. It is the remains are of a young boy wearing a necklace matching the designs and manufacture of Egyptian beads. Check this out. The collar matched the collar around the neck of King Tut. Although these are very small leads, these are of more substance than anything we have ever been presented in the lore and legend of this whole story unfolding. There's a little bit more credibility when I see that somewhere in Ireland, while this person was excavating in 1955, and they've basically traced the body. It is an Egyptian boy bearing the, basically a replica of King Tut's necklace. So if you even want to say, wow, you're really pulling at straws, but these are at least straws that came out of the ground, not ones that were fabricated. So what about the Tia Tefai story? In 1840, a man named John Wilson, who wrote Our Israelitish Origins, uh, he basically takes the two names, and he kind of conflates them. And for the first time, between 1840 and 1860, the name Teotephi appears. Here's the problem with that, and I'm going to explain this to you, and again, there's nothing here that I'm not willing for you to go and check out for yourself. That's how confident I am in the research that I've done. Um, it is F.R.A. Glover's work that's published in 1861, and we know that the work there unequivocally, he, he then d basically takes up Wilson's work, and Tia Tefai basically is born in this work. Now, I know why this was done. Um, F.R. Glover was writing for Queen Victoria, and he was on a mission to prove unequivocally the line of Hebrew Israelitish connection from the seat and throne of England backwards. And although we can prove it, it's not through this way because this is wholly, it's made up of whole cloth. So you have Wilson's ideas in 1840 that are then taken up by F.A. Glover's in 1861. His ideas get taken up by C.A.L. Totten, professor of military tactics in the first of five volumes called Our Race, published in 1890. And he was followed by Reverend W. M. H. Milner of the Royal House of Britain that wrote An Enduring Dynasty in 1902, expanded in 1908, that basically propagates this whole story of Tia Tefai, a person who does not exist. Let me tell you who does exist, a person named T and a person named Tef. Isn't that convenient? So let me read you what I found. Tef turns out to be the daughter of Bactir, the king of Spain. Having been married to Canthon, king of Britain, she died there, but her body was brought back to Spain, and a mound or moor was established in her memory. That is Tef. T is the daughter of Lugge, son of Ith, who married Hermon, son of Miletus in Spain, before migrating to Ireland. These are two separate and distinct people. If you don't believe me, here's what I found about uh, F.R.A. Glover's work. When I started investigating his work, he seems to quote a poem that is attributed to, and again, I'm probably butchering these names, Quan Olachin, 
Uh, it's a poem from 1024. It's made up of 72 lines, and I can see that Glover took and published 38 of the lines, actually citing one twice, using a slightly different translation, omitting other pieces of information that would have negated the whole story to fit his intentions. So the poem reads something like this. The first four lines, Harrimon provides a mound for Tia when she dies. Verses 5 through 15 give an account of the marriage of Tef, daughter of Bactir, to Canthon, British king, and the return of her body to Spain when she died. Um, George Petrie expanded on this and said the meaning of the tomb in Spain was for Tef, modeled after that which Harrimon built the mur or mound of T on the hill of Timur, called Terra, for two distinct women who lived in different places at different times. Again, I really would urge you if you're interested, some may say, well, I don't care, I don't, you know, it doesn't, doesn't bother me. Well, you should care, especially when we walk around with all of this information we've just quoted and taken in wholeheartedly. Again, if you don't believe what I'm saying, I highly urge you, there are plenty of sources that whether it's through an illustrated history of Ireland, Ireland's ancient schools and scholars, and it goes on and on and on for the reference material. Seek and ye shall find, all right? That's pretty much the long and the short of it. So I have a couple of hanging chads here I have to deal with. <laughs> if Jeremiah is not Olamfola, who is he? Well, there's very good reason. And here, I'm going to leave this up to my listeners, and you can decide, because this is one where I, cannot, I can't put my foot down and say unequivocally, but I can tell you it's the most plausible reference that I found to the prophet Jeremiah. So, in Jeffrey Keating's writing, uh, writing of the expedition of Nemed to Ireland, he lists 34 ships with a crew of 30 in each ship. And it's said that th this party of colonizers was led by Nimeth and his four sons. Now, what's interesting is that each of these are called son of, but when I trace them, they are not related to this Nimeth person. They are not sons in terms of how we understand it. They're descendants of. So somehow, these four that are mentioned in one reference, Stain, Larbanel with an L, Larbanel the prophet, Anid and Fergus Lethderg, or Fergus of the Red Side. And from this book, The Annals of Clonomachnois, the same four are named but in a different order, um, basically saying they came into Ireland out of Greece and explain how they ruled in Ireland for 382 years. Now, you're also going to find this information in the Lebar Gobhala. I'm not even sure I'm saying that right, so I'm sorry, but the Book of Invasions or the Book of Conquests, adding that Yarbanel was a prophet and he was also a chief of the Namidians. Now, you can do with that whatever you want, but somebody might say, well, what about Yarbanel? What, about the, what do we know about this person? From the records that I've gleaned, it says clearly that he was not born in Ireland, but actually was a Judean, number one. So I don't know, you tell me if there's a probability that a man named Yarbanel the prophet, who's a Judean, shows up in Ireland in the timeline of Jeremiah, all right? So that's one. The second thing is, well, people say, well, how would you get to the name? What does that mean? Well, you know that in Hebrew, you wouldn't have J. Jeremiah, you'd have a Yod, Yera, Yeremiah, uh, and if you look at Yarbanel, Yarbanel's name, basically Yar, as in the same Jeremiah, is spelt the same way, Yer or Yar, and son of, Yar the son of. But he is referred to in multiple writings as a prophet from Judea who came to Ireland, who spread his wisdom and knowledge amongst the people. So... Can I make a definitive claim and say, one million percent, this is Jeremiah. No, I cannot. I'm being honest enough to tell you that. But if you ask me about weighing things out in terms of the things we've wholeheartedly accepted, this is infinitely more plausible than the stories that we've believed for which there is absolutely nothing whatsoever in any piece of information to back up anything that we've accepted 
as truth on this subject. So what do you do with all this? Well, the main and important thing of this, and this is why this exercise is clearly important. Remember, there was a promise given to the tribe of Judah, and that was to the right to reign and the scepter. So the right to make the law and the right to reign remained with Judah. And it was told to Jeremiah the prophet that a seed of David would be sitting on the throne somewhere basically until Christ returns. So the question is, see what people have done. They've taken the daughters of Zedekiah and they've grafted them back into the line, basically making them having married Malaysian kings and therefore can basically propagating or concluding that the line of Judah continued down through these two women into the Milesian line that basically kept the line going. But what if I told you that there's actually another explanation for all this that shows you the line never stopped going, the line continued, and what people would like to neatly package up, they want to say the breach was healed. That breach, we're told of, of the two children, that somehow now they were put back together, that's actually an error. So the breach, per se, as we understand it, wasn't healed like that, but I can tell you, the line that was promised of a seed of David sitting on the throne has not been a lie. It's just been grossly, we'll call it, misunderstood and mislabeled. And we actually can sort out, starting from today, going backwards. And if you trace the line, you can make really good sense of this. And you can see where people tried to fudge it a little bit to make an agenda or something all fit together nice and neatly into this package. Can I explain to you, for example, why there are two stones called Leofel? No, I cannot. And I can only tell you that supposedly one stone, it was said that if the rightful king was about to be crowned on it and the king put his foot upon the stone, the stone would cry out. So I don't think that, they, that the king would have been putting his foot on the phallic symbol. That's a mighty reach to go. Um, so I would say safely that the stone that we consider the stone of scone or the stone of destiny is indeed that flat stone that sits under the coronation chair. But as for where this other stone came, I can tell you the guess, your guess is as good as mine. The answer is probably not going to come to us. And what about, again, what did happen to the daughters of Zedekiah? Listen, they were, we know the last known place they were, they were in Egypt with the prophet Jeremiah. So where did they go? We know that he got this, we'll call it, protectorship role. Where did they go? And if Yarbanel is indeed Jeremiah, do you think that we might find these two women in close proximity to him in the historical records? Guess what? You're going to have to come back next week to find that out. <laughs> That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.